Well, it's good when the creek gets out of bank, isn't it? That's when it waters all the lowlands. Yes, sir. I tell you, i got a whole array of microphones up here tonight. But you have your Bible, turn with me, please, to the longest chapter in the book. And the longer my text, the longer I preach. 119th Psalm. You know, I'd rather preachers, people tell me, why don't you preach longer instead of why did you preach so long? But I want to preach long enough for the Lord to say what He wants to say to His people. Now, you can have all the singing you want to have, and I like it. I really do. I thought Brother Bill... Uh, you know, he's my preacher boy here in Caroline, Little Bill. And uh, this fellow that picks the banjo, Brother Bill's pretty bold. And he went up and uh, told this dear brother the other day, and I've known him through the years, and I think he enjoys picking the banjo and singing. Really does. And I like him. And... Uh, Brother Bill, I think, told him, he said, you're the only man that I've ever met that sings worse than Brother Roloff. <laughs> but, uh, now, I don't know, after hearing that song tonight, I believe I've lost that race, too. I really do. I enjoyed that song. Tell me his name again. Tell me his name again. But I know one thing, I'd rather have a song than not be able to sing it, than to be able to sing it and not have a song. Amen. I'm afraid we've got running through our churches today a lot of people that don't have a song. they got ability, they got talent, but they don't have it underneath their head. I mean, when you pass their voice box, that stops right there. Brother, that's no good. We used to preach on subjects like heartfelt religion. Yes. Tonight, I want to speak on the book that makes the difference. The book that makes the difference. Tomorrow night, the Lord willing... I'd like to speak on where are the miracles? Do you believe in a miraculous brand of Christianity? And I hope you'll pray that the Lord will give to us a new vision of the supernatural. And it's got to either be supernatural or superficial. Just take your choice. We're living in the day of synthetics, substitutes. For everything look like. People are running races to the drugstore to find superficial sleep and rest. And Jesus said, Come unto me and I'll give it to you. I believe that. I really do. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I've said before, i say again, most people haven't labored enough to rest. We, we live in two, it's a lazy generation. I don't believe you can sit in front of a television and sit five or six hours a day and then say, Lord, give me rest. He's not going to give you no rest. You're going to have a bunch of nightmares. You ought to have them. And get thrown every time you get on one of them. I mean, we're a bunch of stupid people in this country. We've got every kind of substitute. And uh, we've got living in the day of plastics. We're living in the, in the, in the time of, of, of a man-made parts to go in human bodies and transplants and uh, homemade valves for the heart and all sorts of tubes to go in the body and in the legs and, uh, and, and steel to go. Brother, let me tell you something. You'll never, man will never build anything like God built when he made man. 
Now, I'm not against any kind of progress they can make. Go ahead. But I tell you one thing, we'll never find a substitute for. We'll never find a substitute for Jesus. And we'll never find a substitute for the Word of God. And now this leads me up to the final statement. We'll never find a substitute for preaching the Word of God. And I believe right now our nation is in the awful dilemma and, and terrible fix because we're running out of gospel preaching. I believe that juvenile delinquency is a result of a shortage of gospel preaching. I believe the breakdown in the American home and the dope addiction and the filth and the homosexuality that's spreading like wildfire is a result of not being preached to. Great scourge of drunkards and dope addicts across this nation by the millions. I said millions. It's because somebody didn't preach the gospel, which is the power of God to save. I, who gave me this article? Uh, I think I have it here. Now, Bill, did you hand me this? This is sweet, isn't it? I read a portion of it. Let me read it to you, and tomorrow night we'll come into this. I'm going to talk to you about what to do with alcoholics. There's only one answer to an alcoholic, and that's a miracle. There's only one answer to a dope addict. It's a miracle. But dear friend, there's only one answer to a little delinquent girl or boy. That's a miracle. When we get away from the miracles, then we are unable to help. There'd be no hope for them. I want to read to you something in the beginning of the message. Uh, this is uh, by Lillian B. Yeomans, a uh, medical doctor. I thought I was playing with the drug, but one day... I made the startling discovery that it, like a bloodthirsty tiger, was playing with me. As a medical graduate, I feel that I was utterly inexcusable for daring to trifle even for a moment with such a destructive agent. Needless to say, nothing was further from my intentions than becoming a drug addict. But in times of suffering, sleeplessness, nervous irritability, or excessive strain, I resorted to morphine. Uh, singly or in combination with other drugs. May I pause long enough to say that the, that the largest number of dope addicts are to be found among the medical profession. And the very man that ought to have a clear mind and an alert uh, thinking capacity, it ought to be the doctor when he operates on your little child's brain or you or anybody else. And yet, more doctors are dope addicts than any other group on the face of the earth. Of course, you know why. They have access to the dope. They carry it with them all the time. And it's a quick way to rest, they think. But it's a sorry way to get rested, I'll tell you that. At first, I did this only occasionally at long and irregular intervals. Knowing as I did the awful power of the drug to enslave and destroy its victims, I was inexcusable for trifling with it. My ordinary dose varied from 10 to 14 grains a day. I took 50 times the dose for an adult without any danger to life. I could, by desperate efforts, diminish the dose considerably, but I always reached a minimum quantity because which it was beyond which it was impossible to carry the reduction. When by tremendous exercise of willpower I abstained from the drugs for 24 hours, my condition was pitiable, trembling with weakness. My whole body bathed in a cold sweat. My heart palpitating and fluttering. My stomach unable to retain so much as a drop of water. I was unable to articulate clearly or think connectedly. Worst of all, my whole being was filled with the irresistible, indescribable craving for the drug. I did not succumb without many fierce struggles over and over again. I threw away large quantities of the drugs. I was determined that I would never touch them again. I must have wasted a small fortune in this way. Every method of cure, all the substitutes were tried. I consulted physicians, some of them men of national reputation. I can never forget the tender consideration which I received at the hand of some of them, but they were powerless to break my fetters. Finally, I tried the gold cure. After leaving the gold cure institute, 
I was transferred to a sanatorium where I was under the care of a specialist and my mother, herself a physician, for weeks. I emerged still regularly taking morphine sulfate and chloral hydrate. By this time, I was so weak that I spent most of the time on my bed. Lying there, I read the Bible and I prayed. Oh, how I prayed. As I read, I reasoned. I've tried everything that will power, that willpower and medical science and suggestion can do. There's absolutely no hope for me unless it lies between the covers of this book. Amen. Now we're rounding third base now. I knew it was God's book. Some years before the Lord had revealed to me Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is my Savior, I was not afraid to go into His presence, for I was deeply penitent for my sin. I believed that the blood of Jesus that can make the foulest clean atone for me, even for me, although I was absolutely unable to discontinue the use of narcotic drugs. People whispered, she's dying fast. I was swinging out over the abyss. But then I found a rope in my hands. I had no power to hold it, but there was no need for it. it was a living rope which held me. The other end was fastened to the throne of God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, that was the rope spoken of in Hebrews 13, 8. From the day, from that day the cure began. Though I suffered acutely after the drugs were taken away, I gained rapidly in health and strength, and the craving went, never to return. Natural sleep came back. Hardest work of my life has been done in the years which have followed. God had set me completely free from my bondage. Yes. Oh, yeah. Now that rang a bell in my heart. Yes. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're on dope, like morphine or liquor or nicotine, there's only one hope for you, and that's Jesus. And it'll come through this word right here. Not another You'd say, well, Brother Wolof, I don't believe you ought to include tobacco. Well, I've already included it. <laughs> That's the biggest battle we have at all of our homes. Did you know that? Yes. Biggest battle we have at our homes is to get people delivered uh, from nicotine and from the awful enslaving, cancerous habit of nicotine. Have your Bible. Turn with me to Psalm 119. He starts this psalm off with the word blessed. That means happy. Not much of that left in this country. And he winds it up by word commandments. And that's the secret. You get them together and you got it. Blessed commandments. Blessed commandments. Now that's the secret of happiness right there. It's the Word of God. I've never known of a happy Christian that ignored the Word of God. I've never known of a victorious Christian that ignored the Word of God. I've never known of a preacher that could preach with power that ignored the Word of God and didn't love it more than he loves his necessary food. Now, there's only one thing we need in America, and that is an old-fashioned Bible revival. I mean, a real Bible revival. It'll straighten out the home, straighten out the children, make the husband act right, put the wife in order. It'll take care of the preacher, the church. I mean, it'll fix up the community. I mean, it'll stop the devil dead in his tracks. I mean, it'll give victory to God's people, the Word of God. The entrance of thy word giveth light. So he said, Blessed be the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed be they keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Now, I'm not going to read this entire chapter, but I'm going to go to the ninth verse. And pick out enough verses to show you what our problems are and how to get them solved. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How are we going to get the young people to be clean again? They're dirty, filthy, ungodly. I mean, the young people have missed the way. I mean, I'm not criticizing them. I'm simply saying they just... And wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? When I was born, we had no juvenile problem at all. That's 55 years ago. There wasn't juvenile shelter in Nevada County. County seat town, Corsica County, Waco, name them. There wasn't one juvenile shelter anywhere. There wasn't a jailhouse for boys and girls that didn't need them. They just didn't need them. The only jailhouse looked like they had was home. That's right. And my daddy pretty well locked me up at home. Of course, he didn't have to put a chain on me. He just told me I couldn't go, and that put me at home. I didn't say, oh, daddy. No, no, I didn't say anything until I got at least four blocks away from him. <laughs> then I said it under my breath, or maybe thought it. Brother, there was a time when the parents had charge. 
Now then, they put the leash on the dog and turn the kids loose at night. That's about it. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Why, he gives answer by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Get the young people to take heed according to the word of God. It'll solve the problem. All right? I want you to turn uh, to another verse. It's the 33rd verse. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. I shall keep it unto the end. All right? Turn, me, turn to the 89th, uh, the 89th verse. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. That means it's not going to change. This has been the generation of seeking to rewrite the Bible. Have you noticed that? For a long time they didn't fool with it hardly, but now this has been a drastic change all the way from uh, the Revised Standard Version to Good News for Modern Man and all the rest of it. As far as I'm concerned, this is the best news I've ever found in the King James Version. And I tell you, you're just about branded Nick Ramos if you just keep on staying with the King James Version. But I want to say again, I wouldn't change from anything that got me saved and got me called to preach and then gave me the key to living and gave me the key to good health and told me how to get people saved and told me how to keep my home together and how to be a blessing to my children and my grandchildren. I mean, I found it all in the King James Version. So, until you can find something a lot better, don't come peddling by my house here. I'm just going to stay with this one because I've met every need I've ever had. I've never had a need in my life that the King James Version didn't meet. All right? Verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now then, Joshua 1 8 says um, something about the word. And who was Joshua? He was a follower of the man who got the book. That's right. Joshua was a man that had gone up on the mountain, and when Moses received the word, Joshua was right there pretty close. He wasn't in on it altogether, but he was, he was with Moses when he got the first tables of, of stone of the word of God and came off in there. I believe that one of the greatest blessings that Joshua ever got was walking in the shadow of a great man that loved God's word. Moses stood on the Word. Now, in the morning, I'm going to speak on, on uh, uh, Deuteronomy 10.10 10 and John 10.10. 10. And uh, Deuteronomy 10.10 10 says, uh, uh, I stayed in the mount. I stayed in the mount. Now, you know how long he stayed in the mount? He stayed long enough to get an arm load of the Word of God. And brother, when he came out, he lived on what he got. He only had five books. You know that. He only had five books. But i tell you what it did for him. In the first place, it gave him life for living, it kept him in good health, and he died with his natural force unabated. That's what the Bible said, didn't it? You know why? He said he died according to the word of the Lord. And I'm going to deal with it in the morning. Now, a lot of people get the idea that they've got to get sick in order to die. I don't believe in this there at all. Reading people get sick to die, they expect to do it, and they're just getting what they ask for. I believe man ought to just go to sleep at night and wake up in heaven next morning. I don't mind dying, but I don't want the devil killing me. I just believe that God's people ought to live different and they ought to die different. And tomorrow night, I'm going to say something else. I believe when we go to a funeral, I believe we ought to go to the funeral on the strength of God instead of some dope the doctor gave us. Oh, you'd say, but Brother Wolof, they went into shock. Well, trust the Lord to bring them out of it. I don't care whose funeral it is I go to. I want to be awake and alert and I want to see what's going on. I don't want to stagger in. I want to, if the Lord comes, I want to recognize Him. Amen? I'll tell you one of the things that's really helped me the last uh, 15 years of my life, 10 or 15, uh, I, I just don't want to be dead. I want to be alive. And I'm jealous for Jesus and I don't want to get anything from the world I could get from Him. I don't want him to ever, and, and I know he'll see me. If he ever sees me go around the bushes to get something to kind of prop me up, I think he'd be ashamed of me and disappointed in me, and I don't want to do it. 
And if he can, I said 20 years ago, I said, Lord, if I can't live by faith, you can just call on and take it for me. I'm through. Now, I mean that. I said, Lord, I want to live by faith the rest of my life. And I have, too. I mean, by that, the Lord's been so good. I mean, physically, He gave me my health. And uh, He's given me provisions, millions of dollars, and homes. And, and the work has been born and grown. And why, uh, the last five days, we've had five babies born. That's five, one a day. And uh, I tell you, it's a, it's a real thrill to call somebody up, maybe, at, you know, way in the night. And I've got to call them at night and say, how do you feel? Just fine. I said, well, you just had a little baby. And that's the people that are waiting. That's the people that are waiting. Oh, how thrilled and happy. said, I can't believe it. I won't sleep another wink during the night. Brother, it's a wonderful blessing to live by faith. It's a wonderful blessing to live by faith. And I tell you, that's the one thing that we've got to teach our people, and I believe that's where the preacher comes in. We've got to teach our people to live by the Word of God. And when we live by faith, we don't live by fear. And God's people ought to be a faithful people, not a fearful people. Now then, when Joshua came, after Moses had departed, and uh, we'll come back to that tomorrow, what did he say? What was his first text? Joshua 1, eight. You know what he did? And you know good and well, there's a bunch of those people over there that wanted him to let up and to let off. And they said, I hope he won't be as hard as that fella called Moses. I'm telling you, he came back one day off that hill up there and had a big old table stone in his arm and he drew a line and said, All right, who's on the Lord's side? Get over here. And I uh, said, we'd have the biggest time dancing, you know, and carrying on around there. Let me tell you something, brother. This old book will draw the line. Yes, and any preacher that doesn't draw the line, you haven't been where Moses was. Oh, I know that sometimes you get to preaching in the old-fashioned holiness and righteousness and the Lord's Day observance, you know, like the Bible, I believe, teaches it in hell holler, Legality! Legality! Oh, brother, I tell you, I, I just believe it's Bible. I believe God's people ought to have a Lord's Day. I thought that when I was coming up. Now, I want you to know one thing. When we observed the Lord's Day, back down many years ago, and I'll guarantee you there wasn't any mules hooked up to the wagon unless they pulled that wagon to church. And I mean, there wasn't anybody out there in the field plowing that day. I mean, that was the Lord's Day. But I tell you one thing, there are two things that helped. We had real prosperity back there then, and we had real health. Neither one of which we got right now. We've lost both of them. We haven't gotten a lick of health. This nation is on the final, in the final stages of physical, mental, spiritual, and financial decay right now. And every one of you know it. And it's because we said we will not go God's way. And let me tell you something. When man decided that he'd quit farming the way God told him to farm and let the soil be normal and natural and feed it like it ought to be fed, brother, he ruined his own living and committed suicide. Our soil is not normal natural soil anymore. The cows that you eat are filled with tranquilizers and dope and all the rest of it. And we're living a makeshift life in this country. And you wonder why we've got so many strange diseases like hepatitis of the liver. Well, you know good and well what that is. It's nothing in the world but putting a bunch of junk in your body the liver couldn't handle. You know what cirrhosis of the liver is, don't you? That means you drank too much liquor and the liver couldn't handle it. And, this, and hepatitis of the liver, and I'm not real smart, but it just means the liver had a bunch of junk coming through it couldn't handle. Kidney trouble means you had a bunch of filth you've been drinking at your kidneys with two million filters. Uh, one million in each one of them couldn't handle and so they wound up with a terrible trouble. Brother, if we start eating and drinking and resting and sleeping and trusting God, we'd be well again. You're not going to find it in any place except the Word of God. What do you think he meant when he said, Man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? Yeah. What is living by faith? Four times God said, Now the just shall live by faith. What do you mean? It just means we live by the Word of God. And whenever God speaks, that's what we do. Yeah. Now I want to say something else while I'm on it. I believe it's God's will for His children to be well. But they got to do His will in order to get it. Oh, listen, you, I know a lot of you try to make alibis, and you try to cover up, and you talk about this old saint and that old saint. I'm talking about the Word of God tonight. From the cradle to the grave and all the way to heaven. It's the only thing I know that's permanent down here. Not another thing. The Word of our God shall stand forever.
It'll never be destroyed. Man hates it. He's fought it. He's buried it. He's burned it. And preachers have, took, have taken the scissors of infinite clip, clipped its myth frames of Bible truth and tried to kick out the miraculous. Yet the old Bible moves on today. Why, it's God's Word. And never been any nation, man, church, or individual or home that's prospered, that rejected or neglected the Word of God. Never has been and never will be. America's lost her, her future and her prospects are dim because she kicked the Word of God out. Oh, I know we talk about the Word of God in the schoolroom. Dear friends, when they kicked it out of the schoolroom, is not the thing that killed us in America. When we kicked it out of the churches and out of the homes, that's what got us. You better put it down. I said, when, we, when, when preachers began to substitute some little old book, you know, and having... You remember the time they came out when we used to have book reviews? Oh, they'd announce it in the paper. They're going to have a book review down at this church and that church. And oh, the dear sisters and brethren would flock and say, Oh, we've got a certain man coming to give a book review. It wasn't a Bible. It wasn't a Bible. And then we began to substitute literature for the Word of God. And a lot of it was just litter. That's right. And, and the church has gotten littered up with literature. And we began to substitute here and cut off there. And then the preachers began to cut out on the messages, you know. The old morning's banks kicked out and the altars kicked out. And we began to streamline, modernize. And we began to write our little church bulletins, make our announcements. And we began to get educated and some manicured ministers came to town. And we began to say, not there is he a man of God, but what's his education standing? Where did he go to school? How many degrees has he got? See? All right, I'll tell you one thing. We've thrived on that stuff, but we died with it. I mean, the nation's had plenty of it, but we're, we're dead tonight, spiritually, and there's only one thing going to give us revival. You know what Jesus said? The words that I speak unto thee, their spirit and their life. Oh, listen, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God and just be God up. And said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And if you want to know why we're not having any prosperity in America, it's because we've gone away from the old-fashioned books that my mother and daddy loved, and grandma and grandpa lived by. Brother, you hear me tonight? We're never going to have prosperity again until we come back to the Word of God. Never will. Oh, this old book, this old book. Used to, dear friends, we love this book. I mean, when some pre precious old saint died and all the children got home, uh, the first consideration was, as they came back from the cemetery, who's going to get Mother's Bible? Oh, everyone wanted it. My, listen, that old ragged, dog-eared, tear-stained book. Why, listen, every child. Finally, they'd wind up saying, well, maybe the oldest child ought to have it. Y'all take it. And, oh, they'd hug that old book under their arm and close to their heart and feel like when that book walked in their home, it's safer in that home from then on. Now then, the paper came out the other day and said, the big argument is, who's going to get her colored TV? Isn't that pitiful? I said, isn't it pitiful? Oh, that monster of hell that's paralyzed the Christian life of the home, locked the jaws of the average preacher, and done away with old-fashioned revivals and made this nation a nation of sex, pot living, and homosexuality. All of it, dear friends, it goes with Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah's day. And you wonder why we don't have revival. Oh, may God help us tonight. This book will divide. He said the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and the marrow, and is a discerner. <laughs> it's a discerner of the, of the intent, see. It can discern what you intend to do tomorrow. It'll tell you tonight what you got on your mind for tomorrow. That's this old book right here. Oh, hear me tonight. It'll find you where you are and reveal you like you are. Brother, we need a Bible revival. Moses believed the Bible. Joshua uh, believed the Bible. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 22. I want to show you something. Ah, this is a great chapter. It's brought about revival. It's brought about revival. You Listen, you'll never anywhere in the Bible find a revival that started any other way except with a book. Damon, 
Now, here's one right here. The 22nd chapter of 2 Kings. I'm going to begin reading, I believe, at verse 4. Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may sum the silver. Now, they're going to count the money. That's an interesting meeting, isn't it? Let's get together now, and we're going to count the money. For they sum the silver which is brought in the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. Now, they've been out, I guess, doing a little soliciting, subscribing the budget. And here they are. they got a flock of money now. Verse 5. I, I'll go along with this. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work. Are you still with me? Do you believe that the money that God's people give ought to be used by those that are getting a job done? I do. And all this, all this foolishness, people say, well, you know, it just don't make me any difference what to do with my money. I believe when I give it to the church, my responsibility is discharged and I'm not going to help. Oh, wait a minute. I said, you better wait a minute. Because I'll guarantee you, if they don't use it for the glory of God, I'll guarantee you, you lost your reward for what you gave. I mean, it's just like me uh, giving money to a fellow passing my door. And I said, now, I, he looks like he's sort of poor, and I'm going to give him about 5 or $10. And let, he may go down and get liquor with it. Brother, I'll lose my reward. You better see that your money's given. You'd say, Brother Wolof, do you think it makes any difference what church you give? Sure it makes a difference what church you give your money to. I'll guarantee you're going to be stripped of all your rewards if you put your money in a modernistic church. I tell you, Jesus went in the house one day and he heard him say, Get your pigeons over here and your doves over here. They were selling. They were selling sacrifices. And Jesus kind of got him a little whip and said, Get out! He said, My house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer. You made the den of thieves in here trying to raise money. You better be raising souls. And Jesus looked through the windows and saw a lot of crippled people and blind people couldn't even get in. They didn't have any money to buy a pigeon with. Or something else with. And brother, when he ran that bunch of money grabbers out, then the Bible said the crippled and the lame and the maimed and the blind came in. I believe we ought to make room for that crowd again, don't you? I tell you, God will bless you when you do. Oh, I wish you knew what I was talking about. If you just somehow realize that when you go help somebody that can't help themselves, you're in for a real blessing. God said, if you'll, if you'll, if, if, he said, blessed is the man that lendeth to the poor, because he said, I'm going to pay back what he got. He said, I'm going to repay. Now, it just means this, when you loan to somebody that cannot, I mean, in the name of the Lord, something that he needs but can't get, God said, I'll sign his note for him. And brother, I tell you, if you ever get the Lord on the note, it'll be paid. Uh, in full, with interest. Oh, yes. God pays all of his bills and all of his debts. Let's go on. He said, let them deliver to the hand of the doers of the work. Now, skip the eighth verse. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan, I found the book. You know where he found it? He found it when they dug the money off the top of it. I believe, and I'm going to say this, because, and this is going to really call down the wrath of headquarters. I believe that it's a sin to stack money up in the church or in some denomination in the form of endowment with millions and millions of dollars when Jesus is going to come any second and the devil and all his crowd will get it. And I want to just say, and I tell you, you can say what you want. I believe this is a scriptural. He said that there be no gatherings when I come. And you're going to be, if you knew the truth tonight, how many millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of endowment is laid up for speculation and oil leases and everything else, I tell you, you'd be ashamed of it. Brother, we're living in the final hour. And whatever you've got, use it now for the glory of God. Or you'll lose the reward and you'll be held accountable for misplacing God's money. And I don't, if I know my heart, I don't have any selfish purpose in mind except to say, Brother, if you've got anything to do anything with for God, you better get it done real quick. You'd say, well, Brother Olaf, just suppose, and I don't mean to brag about it, the Lord knows my heart and I'm on the spot tonight before Him and He's got His big recorder turning and He's got all of it going down on my record and I'll have to face it one of these days. And you'd say, well, what if you had a million dollars I'd give every dime of it away before I go to bed tonight? 
I really mean I don't. I don't have need. That'd be a, I'd, I'd get that off my mind. I wouldn't want Jesus to come at midnight tonight and find me with a wad of money that I hadn't used for his glory. And the Lord knows that I've had an opportunity. And I, I hope you won't take this in the flesh now because the Lord knows my heart. And I don't talk like this very often, but I've had an opportunity to get a million dollars. I mean, I could have stuck a million dollars away. I know that. But, oh, listen, I'd have never been as happy as I am tonight because I wouldn't have been living by faith. I wouldn't have been living by faith. I know you don't understand, but the Lord called me. That's the reason the Lord has never permitted us to charge one penny for anything we've ever done. I'm talking about whether it's a wedding or whether it's 200 tons of rich, beautiful fruit out of the valley or whether it's uh, uh, six tons of, of speckled trout we've caught this summer down the intercoastal or whether it's those records or albums, 14 of them. Listen, God said, son, if you're going to trust me, you're not going to be peddling and selling. Now, that may not appeal. It may not apply to everybody else. Now, I'm not expecting everybody to have to live the way I live, but this is God's plan for my life and I don't intend to ever change it. I believe it pleases him, and he's been so good and so gracious. And there have been times when I tell you I'd go to bed at night wondering where on earth and how we'd ever make it through the next day. Oh, at the stories of faith I could tell tonight. And how precious and gracious the Lord has been. And it's all, it's all been through reading the Bible, believing the Bible, and seeing God supply all the needs. Dear friends, how could it be an accident? I said, how could it be an accident? That $1,500 has to come in every time the sun comes up in order to pay the bills. And yet, the Lord completely severed and separated me from every connection I ever had in this world for money. I mean, no denomination so far as uh, rich and no rich men. I mean, nobody. And yet, the Lord, through His little old humble, sweet children, has supplied all the needs through these many years. Every alcoholic that's ever come came free. Every little girl. And there are two very sweet and precious girls in this building tonight that have already made their trip to be with us and have come back home. And I tell you, Two finer girls are not alive that I know of. Two happier girls are not alive than these girls. You talk about precious girls, they never presented one problem, not one. They just needed some help for a while, and they got it. And they'll love us till their dying day, and we'll love them just as long and throughout eternity. But oh, it was because somebody else gave. They never got a bill. They never paid one penny. And I imagine we shipped them back on an airplane. I do not remember, but I imagine we did. And uh, we footed every bill that ever needed to be footed, whether it was maternity clothes or a trip to the hospital or whatever it was. Brother, somebody cared! And it wasn't just Brother Olaf either. I don't want you to know that. It's God's sweet children across this country. Oh, <laughs> talk about rich. Hey, a lot of riches besides money. Did you know that? Let me share something with you. You know... The Bible said we're heirs and joint heirs. Now, i got a keen imagination. I live on it a good deal. I read the Bible and I see a heap of things and I get happy. And, and I, but listen, I've never been able to imagine what that joint heir business means. I said I'm an heir of God and I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Now, you don't understand what I'm talking about, and I don't either, but I tell you, if I give you an illustration, you name the richest man on the face of this earth. His name, I don't know who he is, see? I mean, he hadn't come see me lately, but anyhow, uh, if, if, if you show him, but if he were to come in tonight, and he walk in that door back there, and he said, I want to see Brother Olaf, and dear Brother Hugh would say, well, he'll be through preaching after an hour or two, and he'll be glad to see you. And uh, so... I'd go out there, and he said, Brother Wolof, could I have a private talk with you tonight? And I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir, if I can help you. No, he said, not a matter if you help me, I won't help you. Well, I said, all right, we'll talk. So we go to the room, and he said, Brother Wolof, I, I haven't got enough uh, CPAs, I guess, to figure out how much I'm worth. I mean, I, there's no way on earth I don't know how many ranches I got, and I don't know how many bank accounts, and how many bonds, and, and I don't know how many farms, and I don't know how many counties, and I don't know how many banks I own, and... I, I mean, I, I really, I have no idea financially what I'm worth. But I mean, it would run into the hundreds of millions. And he said, Brother Olaf, I feel like I'd like to set up a joint 
checking account with you. I said, run that through again. <laughs> he said, it's kind of hard to believe in it. And I said, yeah, but I like the way it sounded. Say it again. He said, I'd like to set up a joint account with you. And I'd like to have your signature. And uh, it, it'll just be account by, say, uh, you know, Mr. J.P. Jones and L.L. Roloff. That's where we're going to set it up. I said, now, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> oh, yes. He said, I've got my mind made up. I, I believe in what you're doing, and I believe the girls and the boys, and I believe we ought to build some homes, and, and I, I tell you, I've got more than we'll ever use up, and uh, I want you to start checking just as quick as you can. I said, did you bring a checkbook with you? <laughs> he said, listen, and he pulls out a checkbook with about 2,000 checks in it, and I said, now, I, I'll, I'll start tonight. I mean, just as soon as you're gone, I'm going to start making plans. I mean, I'll have a very busy night tonight. I mean, somehow or another, I have no desire to sleep. I mean, I'm the most wide awake fellow you've ever seen in your life. And I've got a bunch of telephone calls to make. I want to talk to some contractors and some architects. And we're going to set some buildings to work tomorrow. And it'll be concrete hall tomorrow and so forth. Uh, brother, you talk about running a race, writing checks. I'd get after it. You'd say, how much would you spend? Just everything that I could. I just everything that I could. I, I mean, I'd cut his bank account way down in the next just little while. Now, you'd say, but Brother Olaf, I guess that's not going to be so. And yet Jesus said, we're joint heirs. Now, you think about that. I mean, this thing's been circling around in my soul the last week or two. Now, if I'm a joint, I mean, if we got a joint account, if we got a joint account, then it looks to me like I'm going to have to start writing bigger checks. Now, I believe that God's people have access to everything that they need. And I believe we do it in the name of Jesus, through in His wonderful name. Now, what happened? Hilkiah the high priest said, Chief and the scribe, I've found the book. I've found the book. And brother, when you find this book, you found the secret and the key. Tomorrow night, I want uh, Mel and Betty to sing the song, another song that they've written on Faith is the Key. And the Bible is the key to the faith. And if you really want real victory, you're going to have to come right to the book. Now, I'm not talking about uh, just reading it once a week or on Sunday. If we'll get in the Bible and make it our daily diet, God will begin to build us up in the faith. You know, Moses said, I stayed in the mount. Now, the last, one of the times I read that a few months ago, the Lord gave me these simple things. When Moses stayed in the mount and got the Word of God, he got a real inspection. Second, he got Bible correction. He got a holy affection. He got complete protection, and the Lord knows he needed it. Working with that millions of Israelites that complained and fussed, Complete protection. He got a good complexion because they said his face shined. Amen. He got and he made he gave off a fine reflection and he got a vision of the resurrection. Brother, he got all that. Where? Up there in the mount. Man, everybody sprayed the thunder and the light, and he wasn't. He's enjoying it. You know. You'll never enjoy the Bible until you get to where you like the lightning and the flashing and the thundering of the Bible. See, I mean, see, a lot of people scared. Preacher comes, you know, and, 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 and he, he hollers out loud and gets excited, you know. You've got to get to where you'll enjoy the thundering and the lightning and all that. You, you, it's all through the Bible. It's everywhere through the Bible. I tell you, people tremble. And, and the fact is, you know, when Jacob got out there and he had that tremendous experience and looked like having a wonderful time, and yet he said, this is a horrible place. The Lord's here, and I didn't even know it. If he wasn't so backslidden, he'd have known it. Been cheating his brother. The Lord showed up, scared him to death, didn't he? Dear friends, church is a wonderful place when the presence of God is present, if you're right with the Lord. You know what, you know what scared Adam? He says it's the Word of God. No, it wasn't the Word of God, it's his sin. Listen. He'd been meeting the Word of God there every evening in the cool of the day, I imagine. Well, of course, God wanted to make somebody have fellowship with. He couldn't have fellowship with an ox. He couldn't have fellowship with a goat. 
He couldn't have fellowship with a beautiful sunset. And I get tired of these nature lovers trying to substitute sunset for the sunrise in Jesus. I don't have much confidence in that kind of junk. I hear people say, well, you know, I can just get out on the golf course. No, it's so beautiful. And I can just walk and talk with the Lord while I stumble over beer bottles and hearing people cuss, you know, and raise cane. Uh Uh-uh. I've been preaching 36 years. 36 years. We've had a many a testimony. I've never heard a man get up and testify and said, you know, I was about whole 13. And he said, I tell you, I set that little golf ball up there and I drove that thing for a birdie or a buzzard or something else. And that thing dropped in the cup and I fell on my knees and repented and got saved right there. Whole, no, you haven't heard that either, have you? i tell you something else. I've never heard a man say, you know, boy, I was out one Lord's Day morning just a little after daylight. Oh, listen, my boat had purred up there to the bushes and I was casting. I hung on those great big, big mouth bass, you know, weighed about eight pounds and that booger came out of the water. I fell under conviction and dropped my rod and reel and got saved, right? Uh Uh-uh. I haven't heard that either, have you? Come on. I've never heard a man say, you know, Sunday night, Sunday night, I eased off down to the bowling alley, and I tell you, I was knocking them dip bottles over, you know, and I was having me a time, and I fell on my knees in the presence of all that bunch of fellas and got saved, and I want you to... No, I never have heard that either. Never have heard that either. I've never heard a man say, you know what, I was watching television on Sunday night, and I want you to know, I got under conviction when I saw all that stuff bubbling out of hell, and I fell on my knees there in front of that old idiot face, and I got right. I never have heard that either. But I tell you what I have heard. I've heard a many old saint of God said I was on the old brush harbor one night. Said them old June bugs is a June, and them old lanterns is a hanging, and they's a singing, just as I am without one flea. <laughs> But Jesus' blood was shed for me, and he bid me to come to him, and I did. And I got saved. That's what I've heard. What about it, folks? What about it? Oh, the Word of God's always been connected with the revival. How many of them I have revival? Word of God. Oh, I know he got permission. He fasted, and he went up and rebuilt the wall. That didn't bring revival. That's good. But you know what brought the revival? When he told Ezra to get up and read that book. And he read the book from early in the morning till middle of the day. And the people began to repent of their sin and God saved and people were made happy and the joy of the Lord became their strength. When? When the Word of God was given out. We need that again. We'll never have revival until we have the Word of God. Oh, so many. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. I must give this before I close the message. Deuteronomy. People get the idea that the Bible won't work, and the Bible is not the kind of book that we're going to have to have. And uh, I believe it's, uh, excuse me, it's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 46. He said unto them, Set your hearts. Everybody's busy getting their head set, look like, or hair set, or something else. But I mean, people go off to college to get the head set. See? I got to get my head set, you know. They tell me I can't preach till I get my head set. Uh huh. He said, Set your hearts. Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. Say, who's supposed to do that? Daddy? Parents? Command your children to observe to do. How many? A-double-L. All the words of this law. For it's not a vain thing for you, because it's your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. Boys and girls, you know the way to prolong your life is to obey your parents. Obey your parents. The Bible said this is the, this is the commandment with promise. And he said you'll prolong your days in the land. I believe that a lot of our young people are dying and getting killed today because they're disobedient. And I believe the parents are responsible for it. I believe the mother and the daddy have not called them around a family altar and taught them real obedience. Taught them real obedience. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Train them up. Train up a child the way he should go when he's old. He'll not depart from it. And as I've said before, I want to say one more time. 
Brother, I do not believe that you have to turn your child over to the devil for 10 or 15 or 20 years, and then when he gets old, he'll come back. I don't think that verse teaches that. I believe the Bible teaches that you train up a child when, uh, while he is young. Train him up in the way and the admonition of the Lord, and when he is old, he'll still be with it. Now, brother, that's the hope of that scripture. I believe it's possible. I don't believe God intends for us to give our children over to the devil any time. The Bible wants us to give every day that we have to our wonderful Savior and Lord. Now you'd say, Brother Lord, what does the Bible have to offer? I'm name them briefly. Conviction and conversion. Salvation, confirmation, sanctification. It's heaven bread for earth hunger. It's God's mind for children's brain down here. It's answer to delinquency. It's our insurance and assurance policy. It's a restraining order against the devil. That thing came to me the other day, and I believe that's good. You know, a man gets to where, and I talked to a woman this week, and I told her, I said, I believe I'd get a restraining order against him. That's pretty drastic, I know. But I tell you, when a man begins to kill his children, beat them up, and maim those little bodies, I believe it's time to get that guy out of there. And some of you drunkards here tonight, dope addicts out in Radio Land, I don't believe you have a right to kill your children. I don't believe you have a right to ruin those little minds and get them where they can't pass the grades. And so I said I'd get a restraining order against him because the quicker you get him to the weed patch of the jailhouse, the penitentiary, the quicker you come under. As long as he can steal enough money out of your purse to get his dope and you work every day, he knows you're going to fix him a warm place and going to take care of his groceries and his clothes and everything else. I said he'll run over you till you're dead. And I said I'd file on him. I'd get a restraining order against him. Now then, I believe that when a man gets saved by the grace of God, I believe that you can get a restraining order against the devil. Amen? I'm not talking about uh, from the district attorney. I'm talking about from heaven's attorney. I'm talking about from Jesus Christ. And this is exactly uh, what I mean. Now, the Bible says, little children... I write unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate. That means you've got a lawyer. We have an advocate. Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he's with the Father. Now, I believe the devil's going to knock on everybody's door. And I'd hate to be so sorry that not even the devil wanted me. And so, I, I believe I'd just uh, uh, go ahead and trust Jesus as my Savior. Now, the devil's going to come. Knock on my door. Now then, what am I going to do about it? Who's going to go to the door? Now, I've been to the door many times, but I never did get anywhere with the devil. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I'll tell you, believe it's just a matter of willpower. I'll lick the devil most any time. No, you won't either. Who was it said the other night? Somewhere. It is written. It is written. It is written. Three times, Brother Mel. And Jesus defeated the devil. How are you going to defeat the devil unless you know what's written? No other way. Can you get a restraining order against the devil? You certainly can. You remember what Martin Luther said? And to me, this just explains it. And I close the message. Martin Luther said, when a young preacher said, Mr. Luther, it seems that you have great victory in your Christian life, your personal life. And he said, what is the secret? What is the secret? He said, how do you live an overcoming life? Mr. Luther looked at him and said, Young man, when I realized that I saved with grace, I stopped going to the door.